Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Oxygen Addict podcast. Uh, it's great to be joined again by Coach Chris Palferman. Chris, how are you today? Hello, Rob. Very well, thank you. Good, good. Well, we're going to jump right back into where we left off at the end of part one. We are giving everybody everything that they need to be confident and comfortable going into their Ironman swim for this year. The second part of our episode, we're going to focus on, well, to wrap up the first part, we talked about the importance of the mental approach to swimming, how it's really important to be confident and calm. And, and that was really, we were surprised, weren't we? It took us an entire episode to talk through the mental approach of how important it is to aim for that feeling of confidence and calm rather than a specific fitness or a specific speed on the clock almost tons of questions came through afterwards most of them around i hope you're going to follow up by talking us through how we are actually going to train for this beast so that's what we're gonna that's what we're going to attack today i think it's pretty telling that we ended up um not through design but having to do two episodes on swimming you know to a certain degree cycling and running we can cover a lot in 45 minutes but we're swimming I think because a lot of athletes swimming is the discipline that they came to last and actually it's their biggest barrier to completing their half Ironman or full Ironman that there's so much to cover and we ended up speaking for 45 minutes just about the kind of concept behind swimming and we've still got another whole episode on the actual practicalities of making sure the listeners can become better swimmers and how to apply it to their situation so yeah it's a uh, it's a complicated one isn't it it is yeah so listen before we go any further there's a couple of things we had uh, a load of questions come through over email so thanks for those we're going to answer those at the end of this episode so make sure you stick around for those we've got about 15 questions came in from either listeners over instagram or uh, email or wherever so if you want to send questions through off the back of this you can either email us at help at oxygenaddict.com or you can dm us on instagram where oxygen addict triathlon podcast over there um, and we're really happy to look at those and help people out where we can just before we go any further as well we did have some um, people asking for information about coaching with us so a little plug for our coaching business at team oxygen addict what we do is we work with really busy age groupers and we prepare them for primarily 70.3 and Ironman distance racing. Although in recent years, as you know, Chris, it's expanded from our, our original bread and butter of Ironman training all the way through to swim runs, ultra runs, basically any kind of endurance event that you can think of these days. But I genuinely believe that we've got the best solution out there for busy age groupers to fit in training for crazy adventures like this around busy family life and around a busy work life so there's lots of different coaching options out there these days but that's where we have really narrowed and niched down on helping people who have only a limited amount of time to train but still want to do really really cool stuff so if you're interested and you want to find out more there's a link in the show notes on um if you listen on podcast if you're on youtube there's a link in the show notes they can book straight through to our calendar have a chat with us to see if you'd be a good fit for joining the team and how we could best help you out for your endurance goals for this season all right. And again, before I forget, if you're watching on YouTube or even if you're not, like and subscribe. We've been blown away, haven't we, by the number of people who we've, we've managed to reach about, I don't know, it's an extra 30% of people, 40% of people, maybe on a weekly basis, just off the numbers we've seen on YouTube so far. So like and subscribe, that'll help us appear in more people's feeds and hopefully help more people on along the way. Right then, let's jump right into it then. Let's first up, Chris, start by sort of outlining the difference and you touched on it here already swimming is different to biking and running and for people who've come to triathlon from either a biking or a running background there's a different mindset needed to go to training than perhaps they've come in with i think it's different if you've come in from a swimming background and you're learning to bike and run and you know we could talk about those people later but specifically people from a running or a, a biking background coming into swimming can be super frustrating because it's one of the only sports where being fit does not seem to help you at all in the acquisition of the ability to translate that into swim fitness, does it? And that's what's so, uh, I think we mentioned it last night, it's so frustrating. And if you can change that frustration into a kind of little project for yourself and 
it's one that doesn't just challenge you physically, but also challenges you mentally, that you've got to find your own solution. And there isn't, unfortunately, at the end of this podcast, there isn't this magic, do this one drill and you everyone's going to be a, a faster swimmer. That's just not how, how it works. But if you can apply your mindset towards discovering and uncovering your biggest limiters, then I do feel that season upon season, you are going to turn into a better swimmer. So try and get rid of the frustra frustrating element that week on week, you may not be seeing your swim times come down, even though you're applying yourself to, you know, to the maximum. But if you can change that into a long-term project of over the next season, two seasons, three seasons, that actually I'm looking to be a more efficient swimmer and finding the steps to do that, then naturally your times are going to come down. So it is very, very different to um, to the other two disciplines within triathlon, but it's a game of patience. And I think you probably went through similar, Rob, where actually in the first few months of a training program, maybe you were thrashing yourself and trying to swim as much as possible, as hard as possible. And I'm sure you'd have plateaued very any quickly. faster. No. Not getting any faster. That was just such the frustrating thing. And that's the, the place to come into this. I think just trying hard with swimming isn't enough to make you a good swimmer. Just trying harder isn't going to make you faster. With running and with cycling, you can apply yourself and try harder and you are going to go faster in your running shoes and you are going to go faster on your bike. In a pool, fit guys can get in and they can try harder and not go any faster at all. And there is like a a block applied by someone's technique that stops them physically moving through the water faster. So that's the first thing to accept. You can't just get in and work hard and do repetitions. It's not going to work. What you need to be doing is practicing the correct technique. And the fastest way to get good technique to improve is to do specific drills that are going to change your technique. And that's a really important point. The purpose of doing drills, I think, is sometimes lost in club swimming. You can get in and someone says, just go and do two lengths of this drill without explaining that the purpose of it is something is going to be different in your stroke while you do the drill. And something will be different in your stroke after you do the drill that's going to change maybe the shape of the way your arm goes into the water. And when you get a feel for that, it will then be translatable into your normal swimming stroke. And you'll be able to, I don't know, grip the water better is probably a good way to describe it. And that will lead to you being able to use your fitness to move faster through the water. I think that's brilliant, Rob. And I think one element that helped me um, when I think back to my process in terms of improving my own swimming, when I was doing drills, I was always conscious that I'm trying to isolate one specific element of my swim stroke and if I can't tell what that is during that drill I know that I'm just going through the process and actually it's probably not going to have a positive knock-on effect when I put my whole stroke together so when you're doing a drill you've got to be conscious of I am isolating a b or c of my swim stroke and then you really think about that process and then you translate that into your full stroke but yeah I think you're absolutely right that we can end up sculling up and down the pool for hundreds and hundreds but if you're not isolating the piece of your puzzle, then, you know, you're just going through the motion. Yeah. So it's a real rough rule of thumb. If you're slower than two minutes per hundred as you're swimming, there's a real good chance that practicing perfect technique is the way forward for you rather than doing swim fitness training. I think that's about the cutoff. I was told years ago by a swim coach, he thought the swim cutoff was about 140 per hundred where if you're not consistently swimming 140s, feeling relaxed and bilateral, something is going wrong in your stroke mechanics that is effectively holding you back. And he would describe this. I still use this analogy. Like there's an invisible parachute being pulled behind you in the water and the drills are going to cut the strings on that parachute and mean it's not going to drag you backwards as quickly. Now, over time, I've come to think, I think 140s may be a little bit on the on the adventurous side, I think somewhere around two minutes per hundred, something changes for swimmers. And just by the nature of the speed they're going through the water, that, that speed through the water kind of lifts their body more horizontal. And that in itself helps you go faster. But any slower than that, I think there's a real good chance there's a body position thing going on that's slowing people down. So that's my rough rule of thumb for people listening. If you're slower than two minutes per hundred, swimming relaxed bilateral hundreds, really focus in on 
your drills to get faster before you start trying to do your swim fitness training. So that's just the, the quick finger in the air, I think, Chris, before we get started. Perfect. And so I'm sure listeners are thinking, if you're telling me as coaches that actually I shouldn't necessarily be trying to swim harder the whole time, does that mean I should be swimming more often? And this is where I think, Rob, it'd be really kind of insightful if you could share a rough rule of thumb in terms of how many times a week a swimmer should swim or triathlete should swim in the lead up to a half Ironman or full Ironman. And this is, this is a bit of a can of worms because there are 20 different answers, but I do think that there are some general rules where if everyone applies to this, you will be a more efficient and better swimmer come race day. I think so, yeah. And, and you're right, it, it is one of those questions where there's 15 different answers for it. But as a rough rule of thumb, I write our plans with three swims a weekend. And it's going to be different for different people. But I think in the in the context of a balanced swim program within a balanced Ironman training program, it's very hard for a working professional age grouper with family, with a full-time job to get to the pool any more than three times a week. I think swimming, and ideally that would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so day on, day off, day on, day off, spread those three swims out throughout the week because there is this element of doing something regularly, helping skill acquisition. I think if you were to swim three times a week, but they were all on the same day, to take an extreme example, you may as well just swim once. It's spreading that skill acquisition out across a week. Now, for athletes who really need to improve their swimming, that three times a week is perfect and plenty. I wouldn't want people going for four or five swims a week unless they're in a situation where they don't have a job to go to. They've got all the time in the world to recover. So I guess we could start at one end by saying an ideal world would be to swim as often as you can recover from. And if that's three times a week, great. If you don't work and you've got all day to train and recover, it might be that you can swim four times a week, five times a week. But for me, I feel like the gold standard for the working age group is three swims a week. And really, it's what we do within those swims and how we use them that's the magic rather than just rather than just a number. And, and even more important than the actual volume that they do in those sessions, I don't think we need to think about, do they all need to be an hour long? It's getting in three times a week for 20 minutes in a perfect world would be better than getting in once a week for 60 minutes. That would have been the exact trap. And I did fall into that. You know, it's um, I would have been listening to this podcast thinking, OK, the coach is telling me to swim three times a week, ideally. So I'd push it to that. I'd try and swim a minimum of three. I'd try and push four or five. I'm probably not going to find that consistency because of my busy life. But then I think it's a really important thing to remember is that swimming three times a week doesn't mean thrashing yourself three times a week. It doesn't mean trying to cover your full race distance three times a week. And I know a lot of athletes fall into the trap of, well, I'm doing an Ironman swim. So therefore a minimum swim set has to be four to five K each swim. And so, you know, some people do that and they can get away with it, but the majority of the time that is not the most efficient way to train for your half Ironman or, or full Ironman. And again, we keep going back to mentality of swimming and how to approach it think another good way to frame it would be little and often and get as many touches on the water as possible within a week but at a high quality so how many times can you replicate your version of a perfect stroke the most amount of times in a week that you can replicate for 20 weeks in a row and so for sometimes that means on a monday only swimming 20 minutes and that may feel frustrating and pointless at the time but if you can string 20 recovery based technique swims on a Monday, for example, on your easy recovery day, then that is going to help you on your next swim and the next swim after that in terms of integrating your perfect technique. The problem is that a lot of swimmers can take that into their own hands and actually think, well, I'm at the pool now, I'll do my warm up as instructed, but then I'm going to throw in a hard 400 to test myself. I'm feeling fit, I'm feeling fresh going to see what the time on the clock is maybe my css is quicker than i think so i'm going to push it a little bit and that's just not the way to go because that's going to have a negative impact not only on your next swim but also on the following day in terms of you might have a hard bike session so you've got to be really patient and i think that's the word that's going to keep recurring with swimming it's mm. it's patience you're not gonna or well, it's very rare that we see a huge breakthrough off the back of 
what you'd call a, a real good swim set. It's just little by little, you need to keep chipping away at the fine motor skills within the swim. So yeah, patience is one. Sorry, Rob, you go. I was going to say, the other thing to remember here is that's for a certain kind of swimmer. Our person who is dedicated to improving the three times a week is the gold standard. We have lots of swimmers who just swim once a week, especially during the winter. And that's absolutely fine. I don't want anybody taking away from, from this podcast or, or video the idea that they need to swim more. If you're the kind of swimmer who is comfortable swimming at the kind of speed that they're at. For the last few years I raced, for example, didn't get any faster. And I was okay with that. I was incredibly time limited. I frankly, I prefer to spend my time riding or running. And I knew that on one swim a week, I could maintain my swim mechanics. I could still get out of the water. And ironically, I didn't get any slower on one swim a week than when I've been swimming four or five times a week a couple of years earlier. So that's really important for people to remember as well. You don't have to do three a week. You don't have to if you're comfortable with the level that you're at. But I think you have to accept that if you want to improve, you're going to have to be getting in the water more than once a week. But it's perfectly possible to maintain your swim. We've seen this with hundreds of athletes on that one swim a week. So that's that then becomes what do we do in the one swim a week and we'll we'll come on to that i think now so should we jump in and have a chat about how we structure ironman training across our three swims a week i think that's probably the place to go from here isn't it yeah totally um so okay. we're imagining that the swimmer can get to the pool three times a week is that the kind of mindset we're well, what we'll go is we'll, we'll talk through the three different kind of swims that we structure and then we'll talk through which key swim it's going to be for what kind of swimmer at what time of year. I think that's the way to go, isn't it? So if we have our, our three swims that we give to athletes and very briefly looked over, one swim is going to be an endurance based swim. And the purpose of that is going to be to get the athlete comfortable swimming a little bit further at a steady pace. So improving their endurance. One of the swims is going to be a combined technique-based swim, and there might be a little bit of harder swimming mixed in there as well, but mainly the purpose of it is improving technique. And the third kind of swim is a recovery swim. Now, it's not the least important kind of swim, but we're going to come to it last for the reasons that we'll get to later on. So when we talk about our key swim and the way we structure that in the week, that is in, in all intents and purposes, if you are only going to swim once a week, this is the swim we want you to do. And if we were laying out a 20 week training plan for Ironman or 70.3, we'd break that down into kind of two halves. For the first half of our plan from weeks 20 through to about week 10, our technique based session is going to be the most important one. And if we're only swimming once a week, that's going to get you to 10 weeks out, ready to go and do your endurance training. At 10 weeks to go point or about there, we're going to swap our key swim to be the endurance based swim. And we're going to gradually increase the length of our endurance swim so that we're really confident by the time Ironman race day comes around that we can swim 3.8 kilometers in the open water, have no dramas, feel comfortable, feel confident. And it's all going to be gravy from that point forwards. So there are there are two rotating key swims. We'll never make our recovery swim our key swim of the week. And it's there for people who are really comfortable in the water. It's there for people who are really confident swimmers and who want to do active recovery on their recovery day. It's going to help reinforce the technique that you've already got, but it's not there to improve technique and it's not there to make you any fitter. It's there, if you like, as a free massage. So our recovery swims would be the, the first one to go from a program if somebody's too tired, because I still don't believe that you recover faster doing anything than you do by doing nothing. I think for most people, just having a rest day is going to be the best thing that they can do. But for people who swam as a kid, they do have the ability to have this sort of really slow, relaxed, easy swim. And it's almost like they've had an all over body massage when they get out of the water and they feel fantastic. So for a small number of people, that recovery swim can be you know, a really good extra swim to have in the week. But for the most part, we're going to change between those two key swims, the technique swim and the endurance swim. From experience, I um, I used to have a recovery swim within my plan. I always made sure that I'd integrate it. And it was 
slightly optional. If I was mm. really, really fatigued, then I'd be very happy to let go. But I do think for the athlete that is very consistent with their swimming. So it's not as if they're trying to increase their swim mileage by having the swim. As you were just saying, this is just a feel good activity more than anything. Yeah. But from my experience, um, so if I did this swim on a Monday, come Tuesday when I'd have a harder session, whether it was bike or run, I'd always feel slightly better when I approach that that session. And I, you know, it's kind of that taper feeling. If you have a full day off and you don't necessarily feel like you need it, you can end up feeling a little bit stale. So for me personally, it just helps having that kind of movement and that kind of switch off activity where I'm still able to work on my triathlon without the pressure of intervals and kind of times to hit. So if mm-hmm. you're an athlete that is super consistent, you know, they're never missing a session, then I do think the recovery swim can play a key part into, you know, helping their overall triathlon. Yeah. I think that the key is athletes have to be honest how they feel getting out of the water and how they feel the next day. And if, if it's making you feel better for doing a recovery swim, there's your answer. But if it's not, there's also your answer. And I think that's the key. If, if you are a highly driven to high pay personality, having a session on the plan that you miss can be really hard mentally, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. It's, it's what is going to help you recover most today. And if it's not the swim, don't do the swim. And if it is the swim, get it done for sure. Totally. And this is um, a slight side point, but I think it really does relate is with the conversations I've had recently with some of my athletes is that they are feeling more fatigued than they'd expect or that I'd expect after even a relatively low intensity endurance room, for example. And when you delve into that with the athlete and you ask them, how did you fuel it pre-swim, during swim and after swim? Actually, a lot of the time they're saying, oh, I didn't. I just had a water bottle waiting waiting for me in the car. And to be honest, that's not enough. You're doing a lot of volume in all three disciplines, plus strength and conditioning. And I think that a lot of athletes are falling into the trap of not fueling these relatively easy sessions. And so not giving them the respect they need almost. Exactly. They they do deserve respect. And, you know, swimming 2K, 3K for anyone is going to be taxing to a certain degree, even if you don't feel it at the time. And just because you're very fit doesn't mean you don't need to fuel it. And I feel that there's going to be a knock on of if you're not fueling it properly, you're going to be fatigued from every swim, even though you feel that you shouldn't be. And also your technique is going to start dropping off slightly earlier than you'd expect. And then therefore you're reinforcing poor technique. So if there's another takeaway, if you're a regular swimmer, and even if you're not, to be honest, even if you're swimming once a week, approach that swim with a lot of respect and fuel it well pre-swim during and after and you've got to be thinking about carbohydrates you've got to be thinking about electrolytes you might be thinking i'm not sweating or it doesn't feel like i'm sweating but even on an endurance swim if you're swimming at css pace or below you're still going to be having sweat loss and therefore you've got to you know if you're using precision hydration use your tablets then it's not only for the really hard sessions you're doing a lot of volume as a triathlete so keep it in mind Shall we jump forward and have a look at um, some swim drills? Yes, absolutely. So when would you integrate the swim drills? Is this part of the technique and CSS swim? Yeah, so so I think what we've got to accept here is I'm, I'm going to try and move the word drill out of what we talk about, and we're going to talk about technique, because I think there are so many negative connotations for people who've been to a club swim and just... There've been things written on a whiteboard and we have to do it and we're watching the person next to us and we don't really know why we're doing it or what we're doing or how to properly do it. The aim of this session is to improve your swim technique. And what that means is you are going to be moving faster through the water for the same efforts afterwards. So every time you're doing something in a technique swim, it is with the aim of when you go back to normal swimming, you will be traveling faster through the water afterwards. So let's dissociate the uh, the former idea of a drill that you might have heard at a local club with the reason we're doing these now. We've got three of these specific technique improvers that we use with our athletes that move almost everybody through a plateau almost all the time. Because unless you're swimming at an Olympic level, your swim technique is limiting you more than your fitness is. I guarantee it. 
So these three technique improvers are going to work on all swimmers. That's a pretty bold claim, but I'm really comfortable saying that after 6,000 hours on pool deck across the last decade and a half. So the three drills that people will have heard of, we're going to talk about the fist drill, the 656 drill, and the unco drill. We'll come to that last, even though it's my favorite. So if you were given a demonstration, Chris, of the fist drill, what would be the main point? How would you show somebody on the screen what you would do with your fist in order to do the fist swim? There's no easier way to explain it than literally making a fist with your hand. So when you're swimming in your normal stroke, you'd have your hand in a paddle shape. It'd be nice and open using the majority and all of the kind of surface area of your hand. But what this, this fist drill does is it eliminates that and you can't rely on a big hand span. You've actually got to rely on, on the forearm and really good turnover to make sure you keep that momentum through the water. And this was, you know, you mentioned that Unco drill was your favorite drill. The fist drill was my favorite. And I, I did it every, every warm up. I think I absolutely yeah. loved it. And it helped me find that feel for the water, which everyone talks about, which is a bit of a kind of mythical um, sentence that everyone seems to say, feel for the water, feel for the water. What the hell is it? Well, for me, what it represented was if I get rid of my open hands, I still have that feel for the water on my forearm and I can still feel that I've caught the water and I'm pushing it all the way back despite not having my hand in the game. So I think that's a really, really good drill. Yeah, you've described it perfectly there. It's It's getting people to accept that the paddle that you pull with in swimming effectively stretches from the end of your finger all the way to your elbow. And it's all the way down that forearm. But most people who come to swimming as an adult don't have any sensors for where the water is apart from in the middle of their palm. If you take that away, all of a sudden people can't really feel the water at all. And what tends to happen, some people might have heard or read about high elbow swimming. All that means is we want the elbow to be high but while it's under the water, it's not about where the elbow is as it's recovering over the water. It's actually during the part of the swim. It really makes you lever against your entire forearm to pull against the water rather than just pulling with your hand. And for most people, I think if they try the fist drill and find it's horrible, that's brilliant. In fact, that's a great rule for any drill. If you try it and it's horrible, that's brilliant because it's telling you that the thing this drill is trying to fix will fix this thing in you. If you try the drill and it feels really easy and you're motoring through the water, chances are you don't have a stroke flaw in this area. But the fist drill with almost everybody, it's going to improve their catch and their pull almost immediately. Yeah. And I remember thinking um, it feels terrible doing some of these drills for the first time. It feels like you're sinking. Your breathing is all over the place. And that's the whole point. You have to highlight yeah. your weaknesses. Yeah. Um, one little takeaway that might be helpful for someone approaching the fist drill for the first time is um, be prepared to increase your stroke rate slightly because you're not going to have the same amount of water that you're pulling through the water. Therefore, you're going to have to compensate for that. And by increasing your stroke rate, you're going to keep momentum. And so I yeah. think that's one of the hardest things with the fist drill is that you feel as if you're losing your momentum and you're just flapping in the water. But if you just actively increase your stroke rate slightly and keep all the other elements of your stroke as you'd like it to be then slowly but surely I think it, it should turn into a stroke that actually is sustainable and 25 meters of just fists after a period of a few weeks of integrating this into each of your swims should help yeah yeah and, and in the early days We'll have people do half the length of the drill and then half the length to swim to the end. It's really interesting to get the athlete to think really carefully about what feels different when I'm doing the fist drill and then what feels different when I bring my, if you want to call it your palm paddle, back in. The comparison between the two is the thing that they're trying to hold on to. I think that's a really good way to think about it, that we can change between them and something changes and then go back to it again for another half length and think, right, okay, I'm trying to keep that feeling of the water pushing against my forearm that was there when my hand had disappeared. So, yeah. I can hear the voices of a lot of our athletes um, thinking, should I be using a pool boy for this or not? What's your opinion on that, Rob, for the fish drill? I don't think it makes a difference. I think if people are more comfortable with it, fine. If they're not, fine. I, I think a poor boy might confuse the issue for a lot of people, but just go for it. I think it's all about feeling where that 
that powers. And if you're more comfortable with a pull boy, great. But I don't think it's necessary for the drill. Mm. And I think maybe trying both because there yeah. is a very different feeling with and without. And if you're able to do the fish drill with pull boy and without, I think you're, yeah, definitely making the steps towards ironing out your stroke. So play around yeah. with both, I think. 100%. So the second drill, I mentioned the 656 six drill. Um, you can Google this. You can have a look at videos on YouTube of how to do them. It's essentially swimming for six strokes. And then at the end of the sixth stroke, you're balancing on your side. And the feeling is you're trying to get of balancing in this area underneath your armpit. So face looks down at the bottom of the pool and you do five kicks and then six strokes again. So we end up getting a bit of momentum from our six strokes. Then we turn onto our side. We use the kick to keep ourselves swimming sideways. And then we get the momentum back from the strokes. And really what we're looking for here is that feeling of balancing and being comfortable kicking on our side. I always think that I watch my 11 year old son have swim lessons and think, the swim teachers don't do them any favors really by getting them to hold out a float in front of them and kick with the face down into the water because somehow they get ingrained in this idea that their, their chest and tummy should face the bottom of the pool as they're kicking. And actually, we never really want our chest and tummy facing the bottom of the pool. We want to be going from one side to the other all the time. So the 636 drill is like an extended kicking drill to give you the feeling of really learning to balance on the side. Yeah, I think um, that rotation is key. And that's where a lot of us fall slightly flat on our faces. We're, we're swimming flat, which means our shoulders are always parallel to the wall that you're swimming towards. And actually, we, we don't want that at all. There should be very limited time where we're, we're a flat swimmer. So the more time you get comfortable on both sides, actually, is, um, is the key in how you integrate your breathing pattern and your flutter kick pattern everything is all based around that rotation that you get. So work on that rotation big time. Yeah. I've just realized I've got my numbers mixed up. It's six kicks on the side, five strokes, six kicks on the other side. But yeah, yes. there we go. I think people get the idea. Um, and our third drill, the Unco drill, this is the, I think it's the, the king of drills, this one. It's, it's the one that athletes, when you give it to them, absolutely hate because it is so, so hard and difficult to learn to do. So my first tip for people is if you can find a quiet pool to do this in, if you've got like a little learner's kiddie pool that you can go to at a quiet time, the first time you try this, that's really, really useful to be able to do it. And what the uncoach drill starts is it's either kicking and swimming down the pool without any arms being involved or just one arm being involved but still having that rotation at the waist, even though we're not using our arms. And if you, again, if you look at YouTube videos of people demonstrating this really well, what we find is really high level swimmers, if you ask them to swim without their arms, their body will still rotate from side to side. And a lot of the forward momentum down the pool is generated by that hip snap. And just because you move their arms out of the way, they're still moving down the pool in that same direction. Whereas when we get adult onset swimmers and we get them to try it, they end up in that sort of kids learning to swim position we just talked about with their tummies and their chests facing flat on the bottom of the pool and kind of wiggling like worms through the water. It's really, really interesting to try and get people to learn to pull one shoulder back out of the way and pull the other shoulder back out of the way. And then when we reintroduce the arms back into the swim, lo and behold, we've got a really good rotation and hip snap at the waist and loads of power can get transferred into the arms, allowing us to go faster. I um, I used to do so many drills and, you know, fish drill, 656 six drill. But if mm -hmm. I'm honest, I never, ever got anywhere close to mustering the Yonko drill. And it wasn't through the lack of trying. I really did try. Yeah. So, you know, I feel for the athletes that are out there thinking, I just can't do this. I think at this stage, that's OK, but don't yeah. give up. It's definitely yeah. worth sticking to it. And although I never got anywhere near to mastering it, it definitely helped with, you know, my overall stroke. And it it was just so painful at times. One thing that did help me with the Yonko drill actually was using a snorkel. So if you're yeah. allowed, you know, you swim toys at your local pool, make sure you, you ask before you use them. But if you've got a snorkel that's, um, that comes out the front of your face, 
then it doesn't affect the rest of your stroke and you can kind of take take the breathing element out of it. You can make sure that your body position is nice and horizontal to the surface of the water. And then you can just get into that really smooth snap of the hip and and shoulder rotation. It's a brilliant drill. So, so hard though. Something to think about for people if they are struggling with it is you don't have to do a full length of it. You don't have to even do a half length of it. Even one stroke of it, swimming with one arm, is enough to get the feel for whether or not the right thing is happening in your stroke. So typically, like we talked about last week, one really big, hard push and glide off the wall, pull through with both arms this time, and just try to kick and rotate at the waist. That will show you whether you can do it, and then bring the arms back in. That little bit of extra drill at the start of length can really make a difference. Okay, so that's covered our, I think that's that's the low-hanging fruit, I think, of drills. Between those three drills for listeners who are not coached by us, if they go away and they Google them, they see how to do them, they learn to do them properly, they integrate them into the first half of their swim set in their technique swim, that is going to be three things that will really help. We've got one there that's going to help the timing. We've got one that's going to help the balance. We've got one that's going to help the pull and the catch. And really, I think everything else out there in terms of drills is is really um, sort of variations on theme, essentially. We've got the, the main stuff covered there, haven't we? Yeah, and the most amount of times you can do it is the actual, you know, that's where the magic's going to happen. It's not going to happen over one or two swims here and there where you do your drills. It's the most amount of times you can do it. And that's what's kind of frustrating because you make this trip to the pool and you're looking for a really good workout and at times you know just swimming with fists or you know rotation is going to feel really frustrating and that you're not making gains in your swimming but that is exactly where you are making gains in swimming so forget about the watch forget about your swim times you can do that in other aspects of your swim set but when it's drill time or technique time just focus on that and do what you have to do to make sure you integrate the right skill acquisition within your stroke yeah and something else i want to mention here for the listeners is for some reason skill acquisition continues in the period after you've trained so it's not unusual to do a technique session to feel horrible in the water to be convinced it's made no difference to try and swim some hundreds afterwards and and not feel any difference at all but then come back to the pool two days later and something has changed it's like the, the neural pathways must keep on getting slightly altered in the, in the period intervening. And you can have a breakthrough swim in the next swim, despite having had a horrible swim in the one that's just finished. So never lose faith that the thing that you're doing can have a massive impact on your swimming. Really good point. Yeah, it's strange yeah. how some days you feel natural in the water, other days you're swimming through syrup or soup it it feels impossible Mm. and so yeah it comes down to that word patience again and don't don't look at one session in isolation which we've mentioned in other episodes it's all about building blocks towards that overall finished article and you are if you're doing your drills you are working towards that finished article so don't give up on that yeah 100 percent. good so all i'll add to the the technique based swim is we mentioned earlier we'd spend half of our technique based swim practicing those technique improving drills. We'll spend the other half of it allowing the athletes to do a little bit of faster swimming. So for those people who know what the CSS pace is, we'll have them do some interval type swimming at or around CSS. So let's stress this. It's not absolutely flat out sprinting through the water. It's the kind of sustained pace that you could, in theory, swim for flat out for about 30 minutes. So it's fast but sustainable, and you should have no problem doing CSS swimming on about a 10 or 15 second turnaround. If your breathing is really, really laid, but after that 15 second break, you're probably going a little bit too hard for those. But it's just a little bit of like the runners or cyclists might think of it as a, almost like a tempo type swim. So 100 meters or 200 meters at CSS pace should not leave you feeling like you need to lie down afterwards. It's fast, but comfortably fast swimming. And we'd, we'd include some intervals around that at the end of our technique swim. And don't be tempted to drop those times. Don't be tempted because it feels good to swim a little bit harder or faster in those CSS blocks. And I think, you know, Rob, you would have seen it millions of times where an athlete is seeing it as an opportunity to lower their perceived CSS. And that's not how it works. We, we've we referenced it in cycling and running a lot where, you know, we talk about an endurance zone two ride. 
and doing that at tempo isn't better than doing it at endurance zone two. So if we say in your plan, or if you um, are doing a CSS based interval session, stick at CSS and be really strict on yourself that actually going faster than that time is a negative and you should have a word with yourself and really, you know, it, it is not better. And in fact, it can be detriment to your overall swim training and, and triathlon training. So this, this is another one that I've just seen too many times in kind of my coaching career. And I've done it myself as an athlete. I see CSS and I see that as an opportunity to, hmm, maybe I can go under X amount per hundred. And it's really not designed for that at all. So please, you know, if there's one takeaway, when you see CSS, stick to that and don't think that your CSS is better on a certain day because the truth is CSS is what it is. You've tested it. So please keep it at that until you retest. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, I love that. Okay, so we've said we'll have our key swim of the week for the first half of our 20-week block be this technique and CSS swim. At about 10 or 12 weeks out, we're going to switch over our key swim to be our endurance builder swim. And what we're looking for here is to really get the athlete feeling more comfortable swimming a little bit further each week. So it might be that we start off only able to swim 1500 meters at this point but there's still plenty of time in 12 weeks to get an athlete comfortable swimming 3.8 k so what we're going to do here is instead of swimming as far as we can continually this is another where place where swimming is different to biking and running we're not going to do the continuous swim we're going to break it up into 100 meters separated by a really short break so at somewhere between a five and a 10 second break at the end of the length we're going to do them at a nice, relaxed endurance pace. So for people who know their CSS, it's CSS plus eight seconds per hundred. So that means if my CSS is two minutes, I'm going to be swimming two minutes, eight per hundred at this pace. I get to the end of the pool. I'm not going to be overly um, out of breath. I'm going to take five seconds to have three deep yoga breaths, and I'm going to go again. And this has two effects. It means... If our technique starts to fall apart as we do a continuous swim, all we'd be doing is practicing poor technique later on. Those little breaks allow us to swim the entire duration of our swim with perfect technique. The five second break is enough for those muscles to reset and off we go again. So that's the first thing that it does really well. It allows us to have that, that little micro break. The second thing is it forms as repeated pacing practice for what we're going to do on race day. If you've swum once a week and swum repeated hundreds at the pace that you're going to swim come race day, guess what? You're going to be really comfortable knowing what swimming relaxed, steady bilateral swimming feels like come race day. And hopefully you won't be tempted to go out flat out for 400 out of the blocks when the gun goes on race day. I think this relates really well to what we said in our previous episode of having the main focus being efficiency over speed. And so this is a perfect example of when your mentality during those repetitions of CSS plus eight seconds. So in this case, call it the two minute swimmer who's doing their CSS plus eight at 208. If you can have the mindset of I want to get to the end of my repetition with the most efficient as possible. So you get to the end and you're not gasping for air. That is a big breakthrough in your swimming, even though the clock time will be exactly the same. So instead of trying to sneak in 205, 203, even two minutes, that's not what you want. You want to hit 208 like a metronome and hardly have to look at the clock at all. You're always hitting 208, 208, 208. But at the end of each rep, you know that you're well within yourself. You're really comfortable. And actually, during the interval, you're able to isolate different parts of your swim technique. Am I swimming bilaterally? Can I throw one in? Can I throw a left stroke in? All these different elements that the, this is the time to do it because you're not so stressed in terms of your aerobic system. And it's, you know, to me, this was the bread and butter. If you can do these sessions really well, that's going to translate to your Ironman or, or 70.3 race time this is the session to stick to the targets to stick to that perfect technique and actually not go faster or further than we're asking you to it's designed exactly in that way for you to be within yourself and for your technique to be refined repetition after repetition i think these are you know these are the sessions that make or break race day i think yeah yeah because what we want is a situation where for the last few weeks before race day you're hitting 
30, 35, 40 by 100, hitting the exact time every time, touching the wall, not really feeling like you need the break, take a couple of deep breaths and off you go again. And you get to the end of your entire distance swim and finish it and not really feel worked in any way. And that's what you want because that's what you want to feel on race day. You want to get out of the swim, feeling like you've had a really enjoyable warm up, and now it's time to go ride and run. It's not about going as fast as possible during that swim. So it's an, yeah, it's an incredible feeling when you find that. I'm sure you've had it, Rob, a few times where you do your not as often as I would like. But... <laughs> I'm sure you've had it once <laughs> where yeah, you, you just don't feel stressed and everything is flowing you find that css plus eight and you can just feel as if you do it all day and yeah. it is that extended warm-up feeling at the lowest cost possible yeah that's good i will a typical question we get is when when are we going to swim a complete distance swim? when are we going to move into open water and the advice i give to athletes is look anytime in the last four to six weeks if you're able to hit these sets of 30 35 40 by 100 in the pool pull your wetsuit on go into open water swim with the same feeling you'll be amazed that you just have that ability as you just said i can swim all day that's the feeling we want people having isn't it i can swim all day at this pace no drama whatsoever and so at any point when an athlete has the opportunity to go into the open water and do their swim i think it's great and usually it's a massive confidence builder because they go in with this nervous, I haven't really swum more than 100 meters without a break for ages. How am I going to be in the open water? And yeah, there's a period 10 minutes in where you start to think, okay, well, I'm starting to get a little bit tired now, but they don't get any more tired. That's the interesting thing. It settles in and they can just swim the entire distance. Without technique, failing as well. Yeah, that's, 100%. You know, that's the key point, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, we've managed to go for our entire allotted duration today, Chris. We're going to bump the readers' questions back to an entire episode of their own that we'll record. We'll make a part three of the swimming podcast that'll come out next week. We'll go through everybody's uh, everybody's swim questions in the next episode. So if you're listening or you're watching and you've got more questions that you want answered or this has thrown up anything you want clarity on, send them on through to help at oxygenatic.com or DM us in Instagram. We're happy to answer those and uh, we'll get all of your swimming questions answered. And also keep an eye out. We're going to be doing a swim special for Ironman Europe on their Instagram feed. So they'll be putting out um, a question for all your questions about swimming sometime in the next couple of weeks please feel free to send your questions into them and we'll pick the best ones to make a, a best of how to improve your swimming for I'm on Europe. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the end of all the time we've got this week, Chris. No, that's great. Stay patient swimmers. Um, yeah, as long as you're working on your swimming, you're working towards having your perfect stroke. So yeah, think of a 20 week period, not just today and tomorrow. Try and really look at the long-term gains that you can get in swimming because that's where that's where it'll happen awesome stuff well listen guys i hope you've enjoyed watching this episode if you have hit like hit subscribe leave us a comment down below drop us an email to help oxygenetic.com really enjoyed bringing you this special and we look forward to answering all your questions next week remember if you're interested in getting some triathlon coaching you can click the link down below in the show notes that'll send you through to our booking calendar and we can have a chat with you about how we can best help you out for your training and racing needs going into the rest of this season but for myself and from coach Chris, take care, have a good safe training racing week and we'll catch up with you again on the next episode.